Hi everybody! Do you remember that time when you worked on Pyro V2 for a couple of days and then finally you made it? Then you sat there thinking, alright, UI form is working, selection works, transaction work, I tested multiple Revit versions and I think it's good to go. So you send it to one of your colleagues and ask them to try it. And on their first try they get a huge wall of red text with an error message. And the worst of all, if that was your boss. Now you feel embarrassed and you might even lose some trust in the eyes of your colleagues. And nobody wants to experience that. And if that happened to you recently, let us know in the comment what was the stupid error that you forgot to check. Because it's always something very small we forget to check because we are a little bit in a rush. And if you don't want any of this to happen to you again, you can use my Pyravi checklist that I prepared and you can download it, link gonna be in the description. In this checklist, there are the most common mistakes that you might forget to check before sharing your tools with the team. And that's what I use now for my tools, so I can see less of your messages when you break my beloved EF tools. So let's go over these most common mistakes so you can maintain the status of Pyravit Hacker in your office. And first of all, I wanna read this quote here on the top. By failing to prepare, you're preparing to fail. And this is exactly why we always need to be prepared before we send our tools to our colleagues. Now, there are multiple categories here and we're gonna start with the first one, the general kind of mistakes that we make. First of all, we need to test multiple Revit versions. And this is very clear. Obviously, every year we get a new version of Revit API and it comes with new changes to the previous classes. It might add a new classes or methods or we j there are just tiny differences when we need to add an argument. So make sure you open all the Revit versions that you use in the office and test your tools. Secondly, also don't underestimate to test it in a big and small projects if it's a large tool. Because you know, for example, in the past I made a tool and it worked great in large projects. But when I created a new project and ran it, I got an error right away and I was very confused. And it turns out that I needed to make sure that there are legends in the project. Because on large projects we don't think about this, but sometimes it might happen on smaller projects. So make sure you test small and big projects. Third one is for international users and that's if you work in an office where you use multiple languages. For example, I live in Austria and I work in Austrian office and we use Revit in German and English version. And I sometimes had to make sure that it works in both in English version and German version. So if you think you made something in PyRevit that might affect the language of the Revit, make sure you test this as well. Thirdly, it's also really good to leave a user-friendly doc string for your users. So they can hover over the tool and they can get the general description, how to use it, what to expect, is there any prerequisites and so on. Just give them enough information so they know how to use it, but try not to overwhelm them with too much. I like to use this template from my PyRevit template and you're more than welcome to copy paste it in your own scripts. And this for the general checks. Now let's go to the next category of mistakes about selection. And if you use any type of selection in your tools, then you need to make sure that you select at least one element, you try to select multiple elements, you try to select none of elements and you kind of submit, then try to also cancel selection. This is something people forget. They check if they don't select anything it works, but if they cancel, they might break something. Then try to select different elements like wrong types, wrong categories, whatever, if it's possible. And if it's possible, then make sure that you use eye selection filter that will allow you to limit kind of your selection so users cannot even select anything that you don't intend them to. And also another one that many people overlook is testing in place elements. We all hate them, but we all have them in our projects, always. So make sure that you create a few in place elements and try executing your script with them. Because oftentimes you're gonna break because in-place elements have completely different class, it has completely different properties, and sometimes it's missing something very important you need. And the best way is to just filter them out from selection and then you are safe to go. And lastly, you can also think about maybe you wanna provide more than one method of selection. These are the checks that I do for selection in my tools. Next, let's also talk about UI forms. If you use any kind of UI forms, you also need to make multiple tests with this UI form. And first of all, just try your UI form as usual. Try to provide all inputs and see if it works. Obviously, this is what you do anyway. Then try to provide no inputs. Just open your form, don't provide anything or maybe even like remove some of the inputs and click on submit and see what happens. Does it gonna give you errors? Is it gonna notify users that they need to provide more? Just test what you get. Thirdly, try to pro provide invalid inputs. For example, if you have a form that says in here you have to provide a number, can you provide that? text in there. If you can, try to do that, see what happens. If you get an error, maybe you should think about how to avoid it in the first place. Then the fourth, it's also something people forget to test very, very often. It's canceling the form. 
You see, it's okay that you can kind of start the tool, see the form, and you submit it without anything. But if you cancel it, it's a completely different game. So try to canceling it and see what happens with your script. Then the fifth is double check your populated values. For example, if you use some kind of list boxes or maybe combo boxes, just make sure that you add elements only that you want to see in there. Because sometimes you might add elements like instances instead of types. Sometimes you can add something extra. Sometimes you can add maybe types of like in-place elements. I don't know. Just make sure that there is nothing that shouldn't be there. Also, there are like a few suggestions that it's really, really recommended that you add some kind of progress or warning bar for your user experience. For example, if users select, I don't know, 10 sheets and you're doing something on every sheet, make sure that you add the progress bar so they can see and kind of estimate the time it takes. They can see like one sheet complete, two, three out of 10, five out of 10, and so on. Then they don't see there thinking that their Revit crashed and panicking if they forgot to save. Then the next one is also very important. And sometimes you need to add confirmation for critical changes. For example, let's say you have a button to delete all columns for some reason. And if your users click on it, just make sure you give a big, big pop-up saying like, are you sure you want to delete all structural columns? And they're like, oops, oops, that's not what I wanted. I just clicked on the wrong button. Just make sure you add some kind of confirmation on these very, very critical actions. Then another suggestion I want to make for you is keep your form simple. If you have to write text describing how to use the form, then you did something wrong. Think about how to make it simpler so users don't have any questions how to use it. And lastly, personally, I love dark themes because light attracts bugs. So therefore, if you use the dark themes, bonus point for that. Now, next one, let's talk about transactions because there are a few things that probably you forget to do. Let's start with the most common one majority of you haven't even tested. Let's talk about non-editable work sharing elements. And what do I mean by that? I mean by that when you work in the work sharing file and use, for example, select a wall, and then somebody in your office also selects the same wall and tries to do something with this, they cannot because you reserve the right to this wall. But what happens when we kind of select all elements in the project and try to do something with Revit API script, but then somebody grabs one of the walls that we selected. Oftentimes that's gonna crash your whole script and, it may, and then you can only execute it when nobody is working in the project. Sometimes it's okay and it makes sense, but the majority of times you can use this simple code snippet to test is this element taken by somebody else or not before making changes to it. Secondly, try to cancel your transactions. See what happens if you cancel somewhere in the middle of your transaction. It's not always possible. For example, you start your script, then you end somewhere here, and then in the middle, maybe you ask for selection, maybe you show the form, try to cancel it right there, and then see if you get a huge wall of red text with an error message. And if you do, just think about how to avoid it. Then also a really, really important one, I recommend you to test multiple projects side by side. Open two projects at the same time in Revit and then try to execute in both of them. Because you see what happens. Let's say that you import some function from your library and in there, you're going to use a doc variable to make changes in your project just for the transaction or maybe you're going to get elements from the doc. What happens is that you're going to go to project A, you're going to execute your tool for the first time and then PyRevit is going to remember that doc variable is the project A. But what happens sometimes, then you go to project B, you click on the button and you expect the doc variable to be project B, but it still remembers project A from the previous iterations. This happens when you use functions from the library and you have to just provide doc as an argument to your functions. Just make sure that it works in both of them. And if there is an error, then you can start thinking how to solve it. Then another one is really important. You need to provide warning instructions. What happens when users click on your button and they get an error? They get terrified and they don't like clicking it again. If they gonna like every second time see an error message, over time they will tr do everything not to click this button again. So therefore you need to make sure that you kind of provide them instructions saying like, oops, something happened. Don't worry, it's nothing serious. Just let me know so I can fix it. This makes them feel much better to kind of share the error message with you and also use it again in the future. So it's really important. And then another two recommendations. First of all, keep transactions outside of loop. Because if you're going to iterate, for example, for every wall in the project and make a change, it's going to take you so much more time if you're going to put transaction inside of the for loop. But if you're going to create just one transaction outside of the loop, it's going to take you a fraction of a second to do the same task. The reason is because in Revit, you have to kind of start transaction and commit it. And it's kind of like a saving Revit file a little bit. Not exactly, but it's updating the database. And because of that, the kind of runtime can really accumulate to a lot of time. And lastly, it's very, very common to use try accept statements when you use transactions. Just make sure that you try to execute it. And when something goes wrong, that you kind of 
rolling back your changes and you notifying users correctly without any warning messages. This is really, really important. Now, let's go to the next category about Revit API elements. And it's just about filtering when you work with elements. Let's say you want to get all balls. Just make sure that you get all instances or types correctly because you don't want to have your instances in the list when you work with types and vice versa. Just make sure that you filter instances and types first of all. Secondly, again, you have to filter in place elements. They're really, really annoying, but we have to kind of always think about them. Because let's say that you want to get all windows and then somehow there is in place element for the window and it's going to behave completely different than all your other windows. So make sure you filter out in place elements or make it a separate logic for them. Then another one is also think about the grouped elements. Let's say you're going to get all rooms in the project and some of these rooms might be inside of the group. And if so, you cannot really make changes to them with Revit API. So therefore, before making changes to all your rooms, A, you have to make sure are they grouped or not. Or secondly, if they are grouped, just make sure that the parameter that you want to uh, update is actually allowed to change inside the groups. This, you know, the varies by group uh, value is ticked on. And then also think about exception elements. For example, you might get all views and view templates together when you're getting your views with filtered element collector. This is a very common mistake because people just get them with the category and then they forget to check. Because it's very, very similar, it has the same classes. The only difference is that one is displayed in your project browser, the other is displayed in your view templates. But for Revit API, these are pretty much the same things. So make sure that when you work with views or any other elements where it might happen, that you know about these exceptions and you avoid them in the first place. And now the next, let's have a look at the checks that we need to make inside of our code. So we can make our code more reusable and maintainable in the future. First of all, make sure that you write the doc strings. Nowadays, it's super simple. Just copy your code, give it to ChatGPT and ask it to describe it for you. That can already help you kind of maintain it a bit better. Also, secondly, we're going to talk about the refactoring your code. You can also ask ChatGPT for suggestions or even refactor your code, even though it might give you mistakes. But refactoring is good because first time we write our code, we do it quick and dirty, and that's fine. But then once our tool starts to work, it makes sense to kind of have a look at this and rewrite certain things. Take certain code, put it in a function, maybe create a class in, from your code, maybe put something in your library of reusable snippets. Just reuse it, kind of refactor your code so it's more readable and easier to maintain in the future as well. And along this way, you can also add the doc strings. Now, the third one is the comments, and there are different stances on what to do with comments in Python. Some people say comment as much as possible. Some people say don't comment at all and just name everything appropriately. And I think it depends on you. If comments help you debug in the future, just make sure you leave comments for you, especially on the tricky situations. You know this meme where, like, only I and God knew how to solve this code, now only God knows. That definitely happened to many of you and definitely happened to me. So therefore, make sure you leave the comments on the very, very tricky parts. Now, the fourth one is avoid hard-coded values. And this is depends on what you do. It's okay while you're coding quick and dirty to put something like element ID of your type that you're testing. Maybe you put there some values instead of creating user form. But then later, you need to make sure you don't forget to comment it out and put whatever else logic. So ensure that you don't have hard-coded values that shouldn't be hard-coded. Five is also reuse your functions. Have a look at your code and see if there is something that you use in pretty much all your tools. Maybe you're always getting the views in a similar way and you always rewrite like a bunch of code. Maybe that could be one reusable function that you could just call in every script that you need. Just have a look and decide it for yourself. Also, if you don't know how to reuse your functions, you can check this video where I'm going to show you how to reuse your code inside of PyRevit. And lastly, maintain a script changelog. This is really, really useful when you work on the same tool once in a couple months and you add some changes. If you're going to have a ch change log, just make sure you put a date there or a version and say, on this date, I released the tool. On this date, I fixed the selection. This date, we updated the UI form. On this date, we updated so and so and so on. You know, in a company where you have a lot of tools and you kind of jump between them, sometimes you create something quickly, then you forget about this. It. It's really good to keep the change log and also the to-do tasks. So next time you open it, you can see, oh, actually, I forgot to implement here, like UI form, so you do this and so on. And change logs just help you kind of navigate and see what was done and what needs to be done. All right, guys, and this was the checklist for PyRevit push buttons. If you think that I missed anything here and I should check something else, just leave me a comment and let me know what I've forgotten. I definitely forgot something, so I would appreciate if you helped me complete this list. 
And if you want to download it as PDF, I'm going to leave a link in the description so you can click on it and download it there. And as always, I wish you happy coding and I'm going to see you in another video. Goodbye.